full screen. Okay. Okay. So thing is, I think today's talk was meant to be the kickstart for the next series of talks. Now we've had these great sessions every Wednesday at nine o'clock my time for the last seven weeks it was eight, but one was canceled. But I think we sort of discovered that there's more to micro stretching and there's more what it offers. And that is really recovery and regeneration. And I think the, um, before I start, just to set the tone, 10 second propaganda, I think people know who I am. I think they know I'm a blogger from Speed Endurance. I'm also a, a writer and author with Nikos on the IAAF NSA, as well as Bud Winter. And I'm currently a master's athlete at the M55 level. I'll be turning 57 next week. So I'm still M55 and I'm still, I'm still out there grinding it away. I still want to run, I still want to compete. And uh, this is why I'm still doing it. Now, so here's a quick pop quiz. Don't, don't answer right away. So an athlete starts track practice at 5 p.m. until 6.30, and then he or she does weights until 7 p.m. How long was the training? Like 42 okay. minutes in that total three hours. <laughs> well, so how, many, how long is the meeting? How long is the training session? And most people will answer two hours, right? From five to seven. That's not quite right. That's the workout. The workout was from five to seven. The answer is 24 hours because we all know that the training begins when you finish the workout. At 701, when you walk out of that weight room and you're on your way to the showers, that's when the real training begins. I think we all agree on that. Uh, what we do at the track, at the weight room is important, but what we do after for the next 22 hours is just as important. Okay, so there, I'm, I'm gonna quickly go through 10 methods of recovery and regeneration. And I'll go through it quickly. We can zero in back on one of them after but the reason why I'm presenting this today is that of these 10, I would like to have other guest speakers come on this talk on Wednesdays and present, if they're an expert on this topic, present uh, some examples and what they know on it. So without further ado, there are 10 that I wanna go through. Any questions before I go through these 10? Okay, so, so we know the basics of how to recover. So we know about active recovery, we know about tempo days. We know about going for a walk. We know that something is better than nothing. So after a hard CNS speed workout, you don't want to let that sit in your legs the next day. You want to do something active, even cycling, walking, tempo. That's a well-known training modality. The next one is compression and to some extent elevation if you run long distance. I don't have any experience with the Normant Tech uh, equipment. You know, the, the big giant pair of trousers you put on or pants in the US and you pump it up. And I, I never tried that. If someone or a vendor of Normatech comes on, I would love to have them come and speak to us about the effects of compression or their product on R&R. &R. Um, some people like clothing as compression. I know because I had a blood clot uh, four years ago from a Achilles rupture. If and when I do fly an airplane, I will put on my compression socks, um, the stockings. I think Paula Radcliffe is also famous for wearing them as well. But that's another topic. I want to have someone speak on compression. Elevation is for guys who run long distance, a lot of mileage. After your workout, just put your feet up, read a book, so on and so forth. The third topic is EMS. And this is where I would like to get Derek Hansen, who's also my or our counterpart from sprintcoach.com and on strengthpowerspeed.com. And he is actually, to my knowledge, the forefront uh, researcher on EMS topic. Uh, you've seen his posts on, on the social media. Uh, we do have an agreement with um, a vendor that does sell the protocols that Derek prescribes. And I won't get into it because Derek can talk about this more in detail. The fourth one is hydrotherapy, which is ice, contrast baths, hot, cold showers, hot cold baths and, and the relaxing Epsom salt bath. I've been told this really works, but I cannot get under a cold shower. I don't know about you, but you know, I live in England. I live in um, you know, an old house and it takes me like two minutes before the hot water kicks in. My hot water tanks in one side of the room 
building and I'm in the other side and I really should take advantage of that ice cold water for two minutes as the hot water comes in. I just can't do it. I don't know if you guys can help me with it. Uh, I've, I've asked my massage therapist. They say start with one second, build the five seconds, but I don't know. Ice bath doesn't do me any good. I, I just can't do it. But anyway, if someone can teach me how to do it, I'm, I'm all open minded. I'm a good student. The um, fifth thing is hydration and electrolytes, and probably more so if you live in hot, humid countries like Philippines or, or uh, you know, any hot country. Uh, it's really important that you do drink and not just drink just plain water. You do need electrolytes. I've heard people take uh, Pedialyte, is that drink for babies when you have diarrhea. I've heard people take two or three ounces, a couple of swooshes and a little, you know, mouthwash cup and just drink it, swoosh it around, and that's all they need once an hour. Uh, that's another topic that someone with expertise can come in and speak on that topic. Micro stretching, number six, of course, this is what this whole talk has been about. I, Nikos would be the best person to speak on this, so I won't go further on the benefits of micro stretching. Uh, massage and myofascial release, uh, I'm a big proponent big champion of massage. I love massage, not the day of the, of the race, but the day before race. I, I love, I can't speak highly of getting deep tissue massage. And I, sadly with this pandemic, we don't hard to get somebody on board and show us technique, but you know, still it's a good topic that I like to talk about because I, I love getting massages. Sleep again, something that Nikos and I have been sort of talking about on the side. You do need your sleep, it's free, it's cheap. I don't know why more people don't use it. We know the hormonal aspects of sleep. You know, the first four hours, you know, one hormone gets released, the last four hours, another hormone gets released. It's so important to get sleep. And of course, Nikos has touched this on previous talks, but um, again, any sleep experts wanna come in and talk. I can talk about it a bit, but if someone you know wants to uh, share their research, I'd love to have them uh, on this call on Wednesdays. Uh, two more to go, stress release, meditation, something that's probably least concern or least known, but I think, I think stress, personal stress, people going through finance issues, people going through divorce, uh, the, the stress of going to the Olympics, the village, the selection process, the scheduling, the buses to the stadium, the buses back to the stadium, the last bus at the stadium, back to your hotel. All of these things are something that stress management has to be addressed. And, and we can get an expert on meditation and sleep on stress to speak on this topic. Um, and the last one, which I would like to speak on more is supplements and real food. Uh, because I do have a degree from uh, McGill in physiology. I studied this since 1986 when I graduated. And, and I, I love the world of, of nutrition and supplements. And the two I really want to focus on is the post-workout supplement. What do you take immediately after you work out? And the pre-bedtime one, which is a tricky one because you have a lot of options and you can only pick one. Um, I don't need to talk about general health, about vitamin D. I don't need to talk about vitamin C. But if there is two topics I do want to talk on a future talk is post-workout and the, and the pre-bedtime supplement. So um, yeah, that's it really. This is the top 10 topics I want to maybe carry on the next 10 weeks if that's possible. Starting next week, we can get someone to uh, speak on each one of these topics. Um, the, really, that was it for my discussion. Uh, any questions? So let's, let's open up the floor. I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on any one of these 10 that we can discuss tonight. If you know anybody who wants to speak, uh, I'm all I'm all ears. Anybody? Jim said, On the subject of sleep, I I I know that the um, the, the British well the Olympic cyclists they had uh, a, almost a kit with a it was a mattress. So any bed they slept on, they had the same good night's sleep. That's what they used to use. Obviously, obviously it's something you, you you use when you're out on camp training and and, and wherever you're going to be competing, but. It obviously needs a lot of management because someone's going to carry this kit around. It's not something you could do, you know, us masters could do if we're going to Toronto or something. We 
but uh, or easily, but that's 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 what they used to do, or they still do. Yeah. We've seen the last uh, international we had in Scotland here, Peter, at a uh, Crown Point, Scotston, sorry. The Russians, I would say half the Americans and all the Swedish, kind of Scandinavian countries, all brought their own mattress. Yeah. All of them. Oh, good. I've got a question, Jim. Saying you send massage the day before a race. Have you tried it two days before a race, and did it make any difference? Um, yeah, I've heard. I've heard that people say they shouldn't do it too close to the race because you cause uh, some damage to the muscular structure. I tried two days. I tried one day. Just any massage is better than none, and I find that <laughs> the, the more I get massaged, the better I get. Uh, the more knots they can take the kinks out, the deeper they can go. And the deeper they can go, the better it is. Uh, I remember the first two years getting massaged, I would scream. It, it's hilarious. I used to work in a, a five-star hotel uh, health club, and I would get you know free massage or, or massage at discount. And, and, and people would hear me screaming like, ow, oh, ow, oh, not so deep, ow. Oh. <laughs> and, and you can just imagine the hilarious... Um, People in the hallways listening. What's going on in that massage room? Hmm. Anyway, so um, yeah, um, I think you, you got to try this. Uh, definitely, whatever you try in your up to the you know your major meet, uh, that same pattern at the big meet. Like, don't try you know two days before all year round, and on the day of the Olympics, you do it the night before or the morning of, right? So yeah. you got to be smart on these things. No, I think that's a. Um... I mean, that, that list you put up, I mean, is, is pretty complete, you know? I mean, I think there's, there's really validity in kind of every piece of that, but what you were just saying, I, I, mean, I, I don't think can be emphasized enough, you know, to where, you know, everything that's going on, there's gotta be a routine involved in whatever you, you're, you're using for, you know, for recovery and, and, and that kind of stuff. It can't all of a sudden, you know, it, you know, you, you can't just do it because it's there, you know, at, at, a, at a major meet, you know, it's got to be a part of your routine. You can't just kind of throw in, you know, daily massage, you know, because it's available to you, you know, at the, at the team camp and, 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 and that kind of stuff, you know? So, yeah, no, I think there's got to be a routine to that. Um, you know, but that, I mean, that list was, that, that was a great list, you know, and just, you know, even the, the sleep piece, um, you know, there's, I've, I've always, you know, I've heard different arguments, you know, on the sleep thing, you know, but I know there's, you know, there's been a couple of NBA teams that have published uh, studies that they've done, you know, in terms of traveling and, you know, and where do they sleep and quality of the sleep. And there's actually, I mean, uh, the Boston Celtics did it a few years back to where, um, you know, they chose, you know, the fact that, okay, if we're traveling, you're really not going to sleep that good anyway. You know, so they, you know, if, if they're playing back-to-back -back games in different cities, that they actually choose to, yeah. you know, stay in that city where they just played, try to get a good night's rest, and travel the next day, even if they have to travel and go straight to the arena, you know, and play the game. Um, you know, they're banking on the quality of the sleep the night before, you know, rather than flying all night, trying to check into a hotel, sleep late, and then go to the game. They're banking on quality sleep the night before, you know, so I, yeah, I, I, that, that was a great list. I think, and I, I think we, we could probably sit through a presentation on every one of those bullet points. And no, definitely our next 10 weeks are cut up for us. I think we've got 10 good topics to go through. Uh, yeah, back on the, yeah. Back on the topic on the, on the, the, the team sports travel pro sports, you'll notice in the old days, they used to always travel as soon as they finished the game at night, they would travel to the next city. And I don't know why they do that. I always thought it was because of save money on hotel, right? You check out the hotel the morning of, you go straight to the stadium, you play your game, and then you fly right out, uh, which is not bad if you're one hour difference. But what happens if you have like Montreal and LA, and in hockey, it's 2-2, two, 1-1-1, two, one, 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 right? Two home, two away, and 1-1-1. One, one, one. Yeah. And I, if you remember 1993, Montreal and LA, uh, it went to seven games, and then you do 2-2 two, two, and 1, LA, play your game, Montreal, play your game. So that was the um, that was back in the '80s and '90s. I don't know what they do today. I'm not connected with team sports professionally, but it does make me wonder why are you rushing off to your next destination? Um, 
but then again, like minor league baseball, everyone travels by bus, right? There's no such thing as like airline travel, right? You, you're on the bus and you travel like, you know, from Portland to Vancouver or, or you know, from California. But, um, but one quick story here that you're all gonna love is about sleep, about massage was uh, Ashton Eaton in 2012 in London when, when he won. Wh when did he win the gold medal? In 2012, right? 12 and, and two. Yeah, so he, he, his, his personal massage was not on the official team massage for Team USA. So, and his personal massage was not accredited to go into the village. So he, Ashton had to wake up early on day two, sneak out of the village, where his massage therapist was waiting for the, with his table and he would massage him then and there early in the morning and then he would rush back in the stadium and then get back in, you know, to the, uh, back to the, the village and then back to the stadium. And, and London was great because the stadium and the village was really close, uh, like right next to each other, whereas in Rio, they were to totally like an hour apart. So uh, yeah, massage, get your routine down pack, find who, who you like, but then don't forget at, at the world level, your, your team massage uh, therapist may not be your personal massage. So again, something to talk about in the massage, uh, massage talk. Well, I, I can speak to the, <clears throat> the Norma tech piece because we, and I know, you know, for one thing, if Nikos was on here, he'd say, Oh, the massage, if you were yelling and screaming, then it was, you know, causing damage and it, well, you know, training causes the damage that creates some of the soreness. So if something else causes a little more damage, okay, I understand that, but is that recovery? Well, it can be part of the recovery and then you may recover from that because, I mean, I was just in the neighbor's pool. It's hot as hell here. They have a nice cool pool and my hip's killing me. So I'll go in there and I walk around in the pool and it helps just the buoyancy of the cool water but they have jet on the side and it's just sort of gentle massage in there. I'm thinking, okay, it doesn't hurt, but even if it did, it's just movement in there. It's more, you know, stimulation. Um, and the Normatech, you know, he says the Normatech, you know, is squeezing really hard. So it may cause some damage there. I actually brought, we got to travel and I brought it home about a month ago when we were able to get up there, I brought it home. And the, just to back it up, the first time I ever used an Ormatech was five years ago when I had my first hip replaced. They went through my gate. They give you, you have to have a portable toilet because that's be higher. You can't squat down as far. And I was like, God, I don't fit on this thing. They must give me a, like a junior size or something. Two days after I had the surgery, I went up to school and the guy was helping me with band, the trainer with little band light stuff for mobility and strengthening the area, which they suggest doing. And I said, you know, the problem is I'm so swollen. Nothing hurts. It's a great bit of swollen. He goes, well, we'll put you in the Normatech. Did the Normatech for 20 minutes. The next morning I woke up and 98% of the swelling was gone. It just, it, it's just like, and I do it. My wife has lymphedema in her right arm because they took all her lymph nodes out. And so I do this gentle massage working up and always working from bottom up to push things to the interior, you know, so then you naturally help, you know, diffuse that. Well, it's the same thing with the Normatech and it pushes up, pushes up. So three, four or five days ago, whenever it was, I put the Normatech on cause I'm really in pain. I say, I'll put it on and try. And I did it for 30 minutes. The next day I was in the most pain that I had been. I mean, everything, my IT band, everything flared up. And I just was like, okay, that didn't work. That was awful. For the next three or four days after that, it was great. So it was literally, I was, it, it really, you know, it roughed everything up. So I was feeling some pain from that. But in the long run, it was the best thing that I'd done in a few weeks on my leg. So does it do a little more, you know, does it create more uh, damage and things? Yeah, but is the is the solution then better than the little pain there? And so that's kind of what I learned from that. I hadn't used it in weeks. I put it on, it just hurt massively the next morning. That night I could barely sleep. Next morning it hurt. After that, it was great for three or four days. And so that, you know, it's, it's, it's another thing though that like Kevin said, because we've been on teams together with the kids, oh, that's cool. Can I try the Norma Tech? Oh, can I try this? You know, it's like we tell them with food. You know, the night before you compete, don't, oh, this super spicy pepper thing looks really good. I'll try it. No, don't eat yourself out of a metal and don't, 
get a massage that you're not used to. Don't get, you know, the Norma tech that you're not used to. Don't ice bath if you have an ice bath and it's right then. So you've got to do those things uh, differently there because it's something that you have to be used to and used to what it's going to do. But it's also something that also that I figure out. So my kids becomes kind of a crutch. Oh, well, I have to, you know, I, can I borrow the Norma tech and take it home? Why? Well, and this is Aussie's well, cause I did a run yesterday. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so some of them, it becomes, I have to Norma tech every day. And, you know, you're not like a professional athlete at a high level training center where they're beating you up and you need that, you know, when you really need it. Yes. Um, so it's, it's like anything, it can be overused. It can become something that people can just, they have to have when they maybe don't, it could be something that, you know, you don't want to use if somebody hadn't used it before. So, but I think it's, I think they're great. Uh, they really work well. I have a chance. Uh, someone was selling one um, in the UK, Michelle Thomas, ex sprinter, now master sprinter, and she was selling her Norma Tech. Um, I didn't buy it, but who knows? Now that I, I can't have access to a massage therapist who can touch me, maybe I'll look into buying one. Who knows? Okay. Any other topics? Um, th topics of interest for anybody that we can talk? Do you know anybody who can speak on any one of these? I can tell you as somebody who can speak about replacement is a, a heptathlete. Um, and I think she was getting treated for an injury. Uh, when she posts on Facebook, she talks a lot about um, you know, rehydration all the time and getting the electrolytes. And, and I think she was still banging all this stuff in in her and and uh got sick and she'd ended up giving herself zinc poisoning because she was just loading all these electrolytes in at, at a time when she didn't need them so i i think the watchword there is as much as it's you know re recommended required you do and take these things you need to know exactly how much and uh, it should be yeah, no, good point. I think, um, I think just well, a little tip for that if you're interested. Go ahead, Tom. So just with um, electrolytes, and it goes back to what Ritzy was saying about are you actually training hard enough? Just in simple terms, these electrolytes are salts. And so if you train in a black t-shirt, you get really sweaty. You hang up the black t-shirt, leave it, let it dry. And if you've got white patches on it, you're losing electrolytes. If it doesn't dry like that, you're not. It's not like the most scientific thing, but it's it's just a really user-friendly way you can just find out if you're actually like you know sweating loads of them out. I wear a black baseball cap, uh, oh, yeah. and you get the it's, sweat it's, rings. It's, it's white. It's white, white little crust <laughs> on the top on the, the top part. Well, are you, then... are you generally tight in lots of places when you get your massages, Jimson? Or are you just getting tune-ups? Uh, I haven't had it any since mid March. Since but gen the generally, when you get them, oh yeah, get, tight like a tight like a rubber band, yeah. Because the I'm other tight. thing people forget with the like the the balance between magnesium and calcium, because one's a muscle contractor, one's a muscle relaxant, and so it's often um, people like take tons of calcium. They might not need it. They might need more magnesium. Uh, women tend <coughs> to be you know, like low in magnesium, uh, low low in calcium more than men. But it's like, so some people take the wrong ones. Um, and then there's things like Gatorade. This is like, you know, 40 years of research in every bottle, but they, they use Gatorade in plus placebos in studies. So well, <laughs> it's just like, the whole thing's a bit of a, you know, it's a bit of a mess. With it's like a multi-billion dollar industry. That's the problem with well, that. Yeah. And the thing about it, and that's why Gatorade, all some of their new products are, you know, low sugar and low this, Reason it's low sugar, an athlete in intense exercise in hot, humid weather doesn't need the new type, the low carb, low sugar type. That's for the people who pick it up at the grocery store because they think it's the healthy alternative drink. And we literally, I mean, we have we had a nutritionist talk to our team a few weeks ago, and she comes and talks regularly. But I mean, I've said for years that Gatorade is a soda without the caffeine and the bubbles. 
right after you, I mean, like you say, you finish exercising and you're soaked in sweat and you've got those, you know, white stains everywhere from all the minerals. You need the glucose, you need the liquid, you need the electrolytes right then. You don't need to have one in the lunchroom with lunch after you've been sitting in a classroom just because, oh, it's a Gatorade, it's better than a soda. And that that's, you know, the other thing that the marketing is, has pushed on them. So then you end up, like Malcolm started with, you end up over electrolytes and too much of this stuff. And, and uh, you know, you, you only need it when you need it. You don't need extra when you don't need it. And, uh, you know, that, I think that's just part of the susceptibility of human nature to advertising and to, if something's good, more of it's better. And that's, you know, that creates some problems, extreme cases. It's like you're in Scotland, the two and a half liters of water that's recommended for an active person in a temperature that's average 64 degrees. So during the winter in Scotland, there is nobody, apart from your top level people, need anywhere near to be drinking two and a half liters of water a day. Because we're barely on free freezing point, windchill, always freezing point, and people aren't that active. They just don't need two and a half liters of water. And all they're doing is flushing out their system and rolling right. their system of what electrolytes and nutrition and all that they're actually putting in through food and normal drinks. They're literally flushing it out. But because all the experts say you need two and a half liters of water a day, everybody's trying to do it. Well, this is, uh, this is what... Um this woman that's, she used to work, she's worked with every professional team around here and uh, Rice University and others. And this is just the basic, and she just tells, you know, people save this on your phone or print, now these days are printed out and that's just the simple urine thing. And she says, you know, if you get any lighter than one, you're washed out. Like you're saying, only just drinking fluids and just fleshing your system out. You know, and what you may end up is after exercise or, or when you wake up in the morning. This happens to me. I fluctuate about seven pounds from what I weigh when I go to bed to what I weigh when I wake up. And then during the day, I kind of get in it. And then that next night, oh, I'm back up that weight again. And, and that's from respiration and from, you know, you, you perspire some even in your sleep. But so it may end up like this in the morning. And then you work to get it, you know, back into here in the day. And you may work out real intensely and it gets like this. And then you get fluids and electrolytes and it gets back to here. But you know, she said there's an indoor bubble dome where the Houston Texans football team was practicing. And a guy that was the nose tackle who was a big, big, massive guy. He's retired now, which is probably good for everybody. Um, and especially him. And she goes, you know, he was an eight. Somebody, so one of the kids said, well, have you ever seen an eight? She goes, you know, really? He was a nine. It was scary. He was so dehydrated and so just, and, and so, you know, you're, you want to kind of be a sponge during the day, but like Alan says, you don't want to be a sponge that's completely clear. You want to be a sponge, you know, right in this area. And then when you wake up in the morning or after training, you may be like this, you may be a little dry. So you hydrate again, but you know, you hydrate, take an electrolyte, you eat a good diet. She's really big. The other thing she's always big on is, you know, the best, the very best supplement is normal food. Yeah. You know, every, well, can I eat this? Can I eat the, can I take this? Can I take this? You know what? You could also try normal food, a good, healthy, balanced diet pretty much covers it, even for high level athletes. Yeah. The irony is that, um, I, I mean, I'm training much better now than I ever have. But then I haven't eaten at a fast food or any restaurant since March 16th. I've been eating home cooking since March 16th, with the exception of one, you know, pizza takeout for a celebration. But I'm just eating my own food, my own clean food. You know, I don't salt my food. But still, is there a correlation why I'm training better and I'm not eating out? Maybe. Who knows, right? <laughs> it's normally the micronutrients in, in natural food that yeah. people are yeah. missing out. And then when they suddenly take it all, it's a boost to the body. Yeah. And people yeah. underestimate all the micronutrients that are in proper fresh food. Yeah. So no, I've also... about... Sorry? Sorry, Andrew. I was going to say, Richie just reminded me to talk about the NFL guy you're saying about sleep and so on. What are they going to do if they get an NFL franchise in London for sleep, rest and recovery? <laughs> 
they don't care because the people who don't have to do all that are making money. So it's everybody, you know. Uh, Maybe they'll just play virtual game and then they don't have to worry about travel. Yeah. I mean, I just, I went to West Coast where Kevin is and back. That's only two hours difference, but it just kicked my butt, partly because I'm getting older now. But I mean, it's, it's fine coming this way. It wouldn't matter. But going there is like, okay, first morning, you know, stayed up a little later with her friends, have a couple of beers and then, you know, wake up at 4.30 in the morning because it's 6.30 where I usually wake up here. And so, you know, that just kind of wore me out, not getting as much sleep. Then flying back here, it's gotten a little better. But, you know, that's not far at all. But then you do the, like Jameson was talking about earlier, the Toronto to L.A. and back. And, you know, for a while, and it may be what you're talking about back in the 80s, for a while, Kevin, you followed baseball more than I did way back. But maybe not all sports, but I think baseball, hockey, and basketball are one of them went for a while to the 2-3-2 two, two series. Baseball. And I said, well, it's unfair because they get three in a row at the away. Well, you end up there. And it was the purpose was, and it didn't have anything to do with travel, wear and tear on athletes, or jet lag. It had to do with the energy crisis. And they wanted to, you know, it cost a lot to do it. And they were trying to conserve gas or fuel. But it makes a whole lot of sense doing a 2-3-2 two, because you save that back and forth, uh, you know. Yeah. So, guys, looking at the list of ten and thinking about junior level athletes, what which ones do you think are the most controllable? Sleep. Which ones do you think that the kids the kids can sleep. handle? Definitely sleep. I had a discussion with my for two boys. One's just passed the uh, sports and uh, science degrees, sports science degree. Another one's trying to be a PE teacher. And they were saying, especially the 14-year-old brackets, are staying up till 1, 2 a.m. in the morning. I said, well, that's the parents that need educated, not the kids, i.e., whatever bedtime is, or sleep time, say it's 10, 10, 10, whatever you want, take the phones down the stairs. Yeah. That's the number one thing. Get the phones away from them. Yeah. Definitely sleep for youngsters. Yeah, Richie and I both work at prep schools, and the average kid on my team gets four and a half hours of sleep a night. That's That'd be dead. A week school, and we're not sleeping. Yeah, my, mine will, you know, mine will say they get more, but then you know, then to compound it, because we were supposed to start August third. Actually, we were supposed to go to Flagstaff next week for a retreat, and that's obviously off. We were supposed to start August third with morning practices. School's supposed to start the 19th, and then we go to 6 to 7.15 in the morning. Or no, 6 to 7, I guess we went to like 7.30. I can't even remember now. <laughs> but anyway, we do that, so they go in and shower, then they have time to eat. We have them bring uh, ready-made, like uh, milk, muscle milk, uh, something that doesn't have to be, you know, sh shelf-ready milk or milk supplement with protein and carbs. Uh, we sometimes have Gatorade there, but I don't usually mix that up in there because they've got their own stuff. And then they shower and they get that in them quickly, get, you know, a three to one carb to protein energy bars or, you know, nutrient bars. They'll go across the street. They can get more breakfast there or whatever. But the problem is kids that age, especially boys that age, aren't geared to being up that early in the morning. They're geared to, you know, being more night owls. But the problem is, not only are they getting up early for school, but I'm getting them up even earlier for cross country. But the, it's probably better than the alternative, which is 4 to 6 p.m. It's like 115 heat index when we don't have lightning meters go off and we sit inside and do nothing. So it's, you know, it's just six, one, half dozen, the other. But it's hard getting them to sleep. And I give them, I give them uh, you know, sleep reports and this and that. One of our assistants was a, a doctor and he would talk to him about it. And uh, I mean, everybody, the nutritionist talks about it. Nico's talked to my group a month ago. He talked about sleep and the importance of not having electric, you know, blue light before you, you know, you can only do what you can do. It's uh, and the ones who figure it out, manage it better. And I'll even ask some of them individually and they'll say, you know, I'm managing my sleep pretty well and I'm getting to bed early and, you know, getting up early and the key is days they don't have it. They want to catch up sleep. He goes, no, I get up early that day and get work done instead of coming to practice. We don't want to practice. But, but yeah, it's, it's tough and especially hard on boys that age. They're growing. 
they need 10 to 12 hours of sleep and they're getting six hours of sleep and they're stressed. And they're too yeah. hard. Public schools around my area have shifted their start time to be an hour later. And they just started it last year. And so we really saw the effects for the winter and spring sports. But it was phenomenal because the ki little kids get up early. You know, yeah. Their bodies work. So we shifted those times in the public sector. And it, and it, was, it was phenomenal. You know, the, kid, the studies were better. The training was better. But there was no pre – we couldn't do anything before school. That was a big yeah. Yeah, see, that's the thing. We've actually went from 7.45 start to 8.35 start. But in the fall, they're getting up early to practice. But now they're not getting, they're not starting at 5.30. They're starting at 6. But there was a study years ago or a school district years ago in Seattle did that. And we talked about it and we changed our schedule. We didn't do that because they didn't want staggered start time because some people have kids in different divisions. But, you know, ideally it's you can start at, you know, 7 30 8 o'clock for little kids middle school age kids be more like you know 8 30 to 9 and then high schoolers you could start at 9 30 to 10 the problem is if you don't do stuff early then you're staying there till all hours if you've got sports so. yeah. they say, yeah they say for every one hour time zone you travel you need one full day to recover from the jet lag so even for us to go to France is one hour, it's one, it's one day, three hours is three days. Uh, me to Toronto is, is, you know, that's five days. So that's what I heard in terms of the jet lag. Uh, Jim, 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 is that going backward or going forward in time? Either or way, either, either way. way, it just messes you up. Yeah, no, we try, I mean, uh, for years that was, that was our standard, you know, I mean, going to a major, um, we we always planned one one day per hour of adjustment. That was USATF standard. Yeah. And I remember when they had World Juniors, uh, not World Juniors, World Indoor Championships in Doha a few years back. I remember Greg Hall, who's in charge of the USA pole vault. Greg Hall comes back and somebody said, "How was it?" And he's talking to a group. He goes. You know, we had to go, it was like 15 hour time zone change. So for a three day meet, they left 15 days early. And he said, there's no booze and they cover their women. And I was stuck there. <laughs> that, was his, that was his sole summary of the trip. How'd the trip go? Ah, 15 days ahead of time with no drink, nothing to drink and no, and all women covered. But yeah. No, but that's, you know, and that, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, like when we, when, when we were, were traveling, that doesn't necessarily mean you need to travel, you know, but you need to be, you know, manipulating light, you know, and, and that kind of stuff. And, you know, sometimes, I mean, I remember getting up and, and doing full fledged workouts at, you know, at 5 a.m., 4 a.m., whatever it is, and then making sure, you know, the group got to bed at three o'clock in the afternoon, you know, and just blacking out their, their room. So, you know, it doesn't always necessarily need to be about travel as much as, Forcing, forcing yourself onto, you know, into, into that time zone. And obviously travel yeah. helps, but. Um, well, that, the other thing, that's, uh, Dan Paff was talking about that years ago. I think it was when the games were in Seoul. He said they were in Baton Rouge and it didn't really matter. It's still humid and warm at night, but at least it was middle of the night. They were, they went on a, the schedule for Korea for like eight weeks yeah. And they would train in the middle of the night and they'd, you know, have them black out and they'd people would have to work out their work things. But he said the two reasons were not one was that, and then you don't need to get in there real early. But the second reason was you can literally get there only a two to three days for what you got to do. And, you know, the travel is kind of weird, but you get there closer to the time you're doing it and you avoid the changes in the, the nutritional and food aspects and cultural aspects of it. Yeah. So you get there, you pretty much, you know, because they've said, and I've done this before, you know, the only thing worse than getting like to altitude or traveling long distance and doing something is you feel tired for the first couple of days. Well, in some ways, you know, if you got like a four hour thing, you go, you travel, boom, you compete right then. Don't wait two or three days to feel tired or, you know, so there, there's that in some ways there's a little benefit for the professionals who do that you know, fly over here, play a game, fly back, because you're not really there long enough to feel too much of the effects. Are you getting tired? Yes, but you're not like, you know, spending two or three days there and then having the adjustment period from a three hour, four hour time change.
Um, Malcolm can maybe comment more on this, but I'm sure that's what Linford Christie and Colin Jackson done for the Commonwealth Games in Kuala Lumpur. They went in and their body clock time, the races were like 1 p.m., 1, 2 p.m. They were only in two, three days and then flew back out again. Yeah. And they both fell out yeah. with the respective uh, Welsh and English Commonwealth Games teams because they didn't do the really. They just came in for the individual event and flew back home. Yeah. That's right, Malcolm, isn't it? It was Kuala yeah. Lumpur. It was Kuala Lumpur, was it? Yeah, one of them. Something that confuses me just a little bit, because um, not, not that I'm an athlete and I'm barely active, but I was always under the impression it was going east was the big issue mm. and going west was less so. And just my own personal experience, when I go, I go home two or three times a year or go somewhere in Europe two or three times a year, that first day and partly because i don't get to sleep on the plane things like that that's the worst part coming back um i mean other than just a little bit of tiredness uh, i don't miss a beat at all yeah that's what i've experienced too and I, I think it also depends you know i've heard you fly over to europe from the states and they say oh well don't go to sleep well you land there in the late you land there at 11 in the morning you've flown overnight you haven't right. slept i can't sleep on the plane and then you land there at 11 in the morning and they say stay awake as long as you can and go to sleep you know that that evening and then you get a jump others say go to sleep immediately then wake up so i guess it depends what you do there what jensen what do you do well no. see as a shift worker and bear in mind i've been a shift worker 30 years and people say to me oh how do you do shift work i couldn't sleep well i can't stay awake trust me i can sleep yeah, yeah I you can. have to go to your bed for four hours sleep for four hours and then get up, and then you'll sleep again that night. Yeah. So if you well, land at 11 a.m. in the morning, as soon as you get to the hotel, four hours is what you need, and then you'll adjust quicker. Yeah. East to west, I do believe in trying to stay up late. Going from you know from London to Montreal, I'll stay up and try to stay up and stay up, and then I'll crash. But going from U.S. to Europe, you have to sleep. I don't care what people say. You have to sleep. I don't care if it's three hours. I don't care if it's an hour and a half. I don't care if it's four hours. You have to sleep on that flight or you're dead meat. Trust me. Yeah. My first time going to Europe, I was so excited. I didn't sleep in the plane. I got to Frankfurt. I was, well, oh, it was fine. 11 in the morning. But then I just faded. And then that night I couldn't even sleep. And then my whole like week was, was just shattered because I didn't sleep. Yeah. Let's see, I, I just have a hard time sleeping. The, the first time I was over there for the group, we flew landed in I think Dusseldorf was it or Frankfurt and had to drive vans I had to get in immediately start driving a van up towards Denmark and we stopped somewhere in northern Germany it's a little town and and we stayed there and I remember I was dead I just fell asleep like a rock and I woke up in the morning thinking okay I'm, a little I'm gonna get I was young I'm gonna get my shoes on I hop down we're kind of in bunks in this dorm thing and I'm gonna go outside and run and this I'm trying to be quiet and this guy goes, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm going to get up and go for a run. And he goes, why? I said, well, it's light outside. I'm awake. And he goes, it's 2.30 a.m. in the morning. And I was like, oh, shit. I went back to sleep. They had to wake me up to hop right in the van to drive. I missed breakfast and everything. I was just about <laughs> like four hours, five hours later. Yeah. And I mean, it's, if you don't sleep or you can't sleep, you you know, that trip east – Going back home, you're awake for like 36 hours. Uh, yeah. And, and, I'll, and it's at least 12 or more hours less when you're coming back, uh, when you're coming back west. Well, keep in mind, I've been woke up on an airplane for takeoff, not even for landing. So, I mean, I can go to sleep within 30 seconds. It's not a problem. That's 30 yeah. years of doing shift work, you know. Mm -hmm. We can't all afford to travel first class, Alan. That's the trouble. <laughs> and here's the thing. Here's the thing right now. If Even if you took an international flight right now, it might be the same thing. I flew on Southwest, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to be in pain going home because I've been walking up and down these hills and these neighborhoods in L.A. And uh, I'm thinking, that's all right. I have my two little free coupon things at Southwest. I'm going to get on the plane and just grab a couple of beers. No water and pretzels and i turned them down because i'm I was like you can't even you can't even get drunk on a plane right now to, to pass out and go to sleep so it's gotten rough 
But bear in mind, Richie, I am the Scotsman that doesn't drink. Malcolm's yeah. done it one of them before, but I am the Scotsman that doesn't drink. Through my own choice. You see, it's in about heading west. This is why I like going to Vegas now rather than Florida. You wake up 4.30 in Florida. You need to wait five hours and things opening. You wake up 4.30 in Vegas. Well, hey, you're out. It's great. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. We've, we've set Vegas for Florida. I know we're, we're, we're past the hour. I have one little riddle for, for the group. Uh, I like to close up with. That's okay. Yep. So, so my last topic in that 10 was uh, supplements, the pre-bedtime supplements. So I think that's really important. Now, there are three magic formulas that I've taken over the years that work for me. May not work for you, but works for me. So I'm going to present them to you. One is in, in any order. One is tart cherry juice. Uh, one ounce with uh, seven ounces water. Man, that stuff is wonderful. And we know why it works, you know, the, the melatonin and so on and so forth. So that's, that's great to have. Number two would be ZMA or ZMA. Uh, I know we laughed about Victor Conte and snack, but I do believe that that's probably the only product that I do like is a ZMA. Why? Because it has zinc, has magnesium, and has B6. And, and Nikos probably talked about zinc and magnesium at some point, but we can talk about those reasons why uh, ZMA is good. And that's best to take before bedtime. The third one is a protein drink, and I guess I'm old school from the 80s. I like to have casein protein, not whey protein, before bed because it's slow acting, slow absorption to the body, uh, you know, uh, 30 grams with water. The problem is you can only take only one on an empty stomach, so you cannot take all three. So your dilemma is which one of the three do you take? And, and I asked Nikos this, he has an opinion, of course, Nikos always has an opinion, but um, mm -hmm. we can ask him next week what, what his answer is, but uh, I, I, won't, I won't, won't spoil it for you. But that's a question for you guys. You know, if you have three things that you know it works for you to go to bed, but you can only take one, and which one would it be? So we can talk about it now or talk about it next week, it's up to you. But that's kind of like my dilemma these days. Not depend on what workout you've just done and what your next workout's gonna be. Ah, uh, very good. You get very a big good. blender, you put all three together, you blend them up, and you have everything at once. <laughs> ZMA doesn't work on a full stomach. I've tried ZMA yes. after, you know, late night. It doesn't work. It has to be empty stomach. Like 8 p.m., your last meal, 11 p.m., three tablets, water, hit the sack, and you have really lucid dreams. Uh, but, yeah, Alan, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you hit it on the head. I to do that. Jeez. Yeah. yeah uh, Equals magic yeah. mushrooms. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, that's that's a Nico talk. Yeah, number uh, number eleven. I'll add number eleven. Magic mushrooms from Nico here on that yeah. list of ten. But yeah, Alan, good 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 answer. That is the secret. It is, depends on what I did that day. If I did a heavy weight training session, absolutely, I'll do the case and protein. Uh, if I did a high CNS uh, speed workout, I'll probably opt for the uh, ZMA. But anyway, a food for thought for uh, for next time. I mean, everything's good. It's just everyone's individual and everybody's reacts different to different food and supplements. So what works for me may not work for you. See what they started doing up here, Jimson, is taking their protein with chocolate powder or chocolate milk because it's slow to release from the stomach. Yep. Now, I've argued for years, well, why don't you just use casein? Because that's slow released in the stomach. Why are you putting all the extra sugar and all that rubbish that you get in chocolate milk? Just use casein protein yep. rather than whey You know whey protein's fast acting. Yep. you. So if you want to slow release, use casein. Yeah, exactly. And, and my my go-to post-recovery drink is in, in university was chocolate milk. You know, yeah. four to one carb protein ratio. Everyone knows me from McGill. I would buy a chocolate milk at the in the Depender or the corner shop, 7-Eleven, and I'd have that going home. But the whole world of supplements, you know, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. And I'm, I'm be glad to talk about that over the next few weeks. But let's take these 10 or 11 topics with the mushrooms. <laughs> let's take these 11 <laughs> topics and uh, let's have a good time in the next 11 weeks and get some good discussions. Just, just to complicate your scenario, though, I, I'm not only lactose intolerant, but the worst thing is I can't handle the casein. Uh, you can. well, I, you know, and what happens with me, especially as I get older, is like I have a harder time with a lot of proteins. Uh, chicken... 
beef. Oh my gosh. Our neighbors made these steaks. We ate outside a couple weeks ago. They felt they were delicious. I had a meat hangover for two days. I felt miserable. So I have a hard time paying. That's why I don't even work out that much. I'm like, like 6% body fat kind of wasting away if I don't eat like a horse, because I have a hard time processing those and casein and others. So I don't do milk and cheese. I do almond milk and stuff, which only has like a gram of protein and it's, you know, plant protein, you could do it, but it's just for somebody who's still trying to be an athlete and has a hard time with that, that just complicates things more. Yes, we started yeah. the casein protein because my daughter is type one diabetic. Using whey protein gets too big an insulin spike, too rapid a spike. So the casein, and I got into it that way. So it's just much better for you. Yeah, and that's what that the nutritionist, I put her stuff up, Dr. Roberta Anding, she, that's the big thing she always talks about to the kids is, you know, the, the best source of the protein, the best, you know, one of the best recovery things is milk. You know, the chocolate milk, regular milk, whatever, the casein is so much better in terms of absorption, everything else for growth, regeneration of muscle development for, for young athletes and even older athletes. And it's, you know... Unfortunately, it's off the table for some people. Richie, what is she saying about organic milk versus normal store-bought, probably got some hormone in it, milk? You know, I think we discussed that at one point. I ought to put you in touch with her if you remind me. Um, because, uh, you know, there was the um, there was the big sort of, it, uh, you know, either there's some truth to it or it's the urban myth thing now about, you know, why girls look so, why high school girls are so well built now. It's because the urban systems have, you know, the, uh, the, and I've even heard one mom who's very, I mean, and this may be, maybe some accuracy, but very well educated, very, and she said, oh yeah, they don't, they drink only bottled water because they apparently they test the water system because of people flushing the toilets the uh the you know the the chemicals and the birth control pills there's so many of them that that's not wiped out in the in the water uh you know process of cleaning it and so there's you know girls are getting all these extra hormones in the water they're getting it milk they're getting you know I, I, I think she said something about it i think it's it's a little bit like it's a little bit like this I, I, and it's, again, this is maybe not the best information. I was making some homemade mayonnaise for something in the last few weeks because everybody's making stuff. And, of course, what did I do? I went on the Internet. And the person said, and I checked with a friend of mine who's a doctor, and he said the same thing. He's a gastroenterologist. That even in the United States and even with egg farms here, you have to have, like, a thousand raw eggs to really have a chance of getting salmonella. So if you put one egg white in and make mayonnaise, it's probably not going to hurt you. I think she was, I think, and I'm not positive, I think it's kind of the same thing with the hormones in the milk and the hormones in the beef and the hormones in the water. You know, if you're drinking, you know, 400 gallons of milk today, you might not let your daughter go out on dates for a while because she may, you know, at 12, she may be, you know, especially well-developed. Well, my biggest you know, my biggest shock about moving to England was eggs do not need refrigeration. Eggs in the United States don't need refrigeration. Oh, okay. Until they're refrigerated. <laughs> growing up, <laughs> growing up, eggs go in the refrigerator. Well, yeah, because they start off refrigerating them to make them last longer. But once they've been refrigerated, you can't take them out because we get them at markets. And I have a friend, one of the girls that um, I coach her little sister they have hens in the backyard. My son used to take care of them when they're out of town. And, you know, we have just fresh eggs all the time. We can get them them. I used to buy them from her for literally nothing. But you just leave them out. And, you know, they last a while. You can leave them out. They don't have to be refrigerated. And, and they taste, oh, my gosh, I hadn't had one in years and years. And a couple of years ago, we brought them home. And you, they're like, a yolk is not yellow. A yolk is supposed to be dark orange. I mean, it was unbelievable. It was just the egg. You didn't need anything. The egg itself was the best thing I'd ever tasted just because it's so different than the, the farm mechanized ones. But, you know. Okay, shall we call it the night, guys? Yeah. I have, it's 10, 15 yeah. on my side. I, I, um, yeah, y'all are late over there. Yeah. The, the oh, thank you. 
But uh, hey, yeah, Tim, so, yeah. you can get off for a second, Joe. I was going to ask you how things are going in in Jersey. Yeah. Wise. Okay. Okay. Thanks, guys. I'll see you next All week. Right, see you, Jim. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Cheers. Thanks, Richie. Thank you. Thanks, Richie and Jimson. All right. See you guys. See you, Peter. So what's your schedule, Tim? What have they done for uh, schools? I'd say, well, 